Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, San Diego gets the go-ahead for pension reform and the battle over California's same-sex marriage ban heads to the U.S. Supreme Court. International travelers have access to new technology to get them through San Diego's Lindbergh Field more quickly. And San Diego's police chief responds to criticism over a request for a $66 million budget increase, plus what local colleges and the community are doing for students with mental health concerns. And getting reelected was the easy part for San Diego's city attorney. We go one on one with Jan Goldsmith about pension reform, the convention center, and other second term challenges. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. San Diego's been given the okay to move forward with pension reform. A state panel wanted to stop the process until a union complaint is resolved against Proposition B. The union claims city leaders broke labor laws while campaigning for the measure. The judge says putting new workers into 401k plans will not interfere with the panel's work, which could take several months. The judge says if Prop B is invalidated, the city can move uh, those workers to its old pension plan. Southern California Edison says it will cost $25 million to restart Unit 2 at the San Onofre nuclear plant. Edison says it's already spent $48 million to inspect and repair two problems at the plant north of Oceanside. San Onofre's two reactors have been shut down since January. Supporters of California's same-sex marriage ban want the U.S. Supreme Court to weigh in. They've asked the justices to overturn an appeals court decision declaring Proposition 8 unconstitutional. The justices are expected to decide whether to take the case this fall. If they reject it, same-sex marriages can resume in California. The debate over medical marijuana led to a hoax against some San Diego media outlets earlier today. KPBS and other media received news releases claiming U.S. Attorney Laura Duffy was shutting down 20 pharmacies around San Diego. The news releases were fakes. Duffy says she is looking into possible charges over the problem. A medical marijuana advocacy group has claimed responsibility for the hoax, saying it was a satirical way to call attention to the federal crackdown. Rite Aid workers tonight have authorized a strike. Union leaders say Rite Aid is asking for nearly three dozen concessions, including giving up health care for dependents, six leave pay, and 40-hour work weeks. The company says the strike vote was premature because the union hasn't made a counterproposal. The two sides go back to the bargaining table tomorrow. The California State University system has made a contract deal with its faculty union, avoiding a threatened strike. The deal avoids pay cuts for faculty and pay raises could be negotiated in the future. CSU also has the option to reopen talks in the fall if state funding doesn't improve. Union members still have to ratify the deal. And students at 14 San Diego County colleges and technical schools won't be able to get Cal grants this year. Many for-profit schools are now disqualified for Cal grants because of tougher requirements. Those schools include University of Phoenix, Kaplan College, and ITT Technical Institute, among others. The new Cal grant standards are based on graduation rates and student loan defaults. California standards are the toughest in the country. The change is expected to affect nearly 15,000 students statewide. A program allowing international airport travelers to get through customs faster has finally arrived in San Diego. It comes as Terminal 2 at Lindbergh Field is expecting a 35 percent passenger increase this year due to higher international demand. The volume of international travelers has been on the rise in San Diego for the past couple of years. U.S. Customs is expecting more than 200,000 this year at Terminal 2, nearly doubling the amount of passenger traffic the past three years as Japan Airlines and one serving Mexico expand service into San Diego. This is a very important uh, uh, new piece of technology. It's designed to quickly move passengers from the gate to this global entry kiosk where you slide your passport, get fingerprinted, and answer a few security questions, all within five minutes as you check out and get your bags. Chris Maston with Customs and Border Protection says Exhaustive background checks are done on each passenger who enrolls. 
just like the Century Program for border crossers. We consider them uh, trusted travelers at the border, and in exchange for that information, we expedite their process through the border, and we're uh, processing most of our Century members in under 15 minutes at our land border ports of entry, which if you've ever waited in that line down there, you know that's a significant time savings. Global entry is the system that uh, we have uh, implemented, same concept, for the 180,000 people who already have a Century Pass, there's no additional charge to get a global entry. The program officially started at a few large airports on the East Coast in 2008. San Diego becomes the 27th city to roll it out. The cost for a global entry pass is $100, and it's good for five years at the airport and border crossings. Now, to sign up and for more information about the Global Entry Program, go online to globalentry.gov. San Diego's new Central Library downtown now has its signature dome. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge gives us a look. The dome will house a three-story reading room in the library's upper reaches. This will be open. Project executive Carmen Van says building the dome was a task like no other due to the structure's unique angular shape. The dome was inspired by buildings in Balboa Park, and Van says it's what makes this library special. For me, it's, it's the, the cherry on the ice cream cone. It's not just a, a shade structure uh, to the building, but it also creates a just, I guess, a dramatic element to the building and creates that cherry, that whipped cream on uh, an a, a ice cream cone full of creative architectural features. The central library is due to be finished by summer of next year. Van says the dome will soon be covered by a series of perforated shades and nearly 80% of the library's exterior is already windowed in. A lot of focus right now is on the interiors uh, where you're, you'll see drywall being put in place, uh, you'll see paint happening right now, you'll see tile going in place in the restroom areas. Workers have just begun building an auditorium that will lie along the side of the library that faces Petco Park. It was KPBS reporter Tom Fudge. San Diego Police Department recently asked City Council for an additional $66 million, but the city's overall crime rates are down. Peggy Pico talks to the police chief about why the department says the money is crucial. The debate over San Diego's police department's request for an additional $66 million over the next five years centers around staffing issues and whether or not a short-term surge in violent crimes warrants the budget increase. Joining me to talk about the issue is San Diego Police Chief William Lansdowne and Assistant Chief Shelley Zimmerman. Thank you both for being here. Chief Lansdowne. Eleven and a half million dollars over the next five years annually, and another eight million on top of that to deal with some uh, equipment uh, dispatch systems. Why so much money right now? Uh, yeah, it's the big question. Well, you know, our role in the San Diego Police Department is to provide the best service possible to the community of San Diego, and those demands and the complexity of our job is increasing all the time. We, we clearly have been downsizing the police department for uh, several years now. And as we look into the future and the needs, we need to start today. And I'll give you the great example. If we hired 100 officers today to replace just the people who are going to leave the department this year, it takes us a year before they actually come out on the street. So we're always a year behind the needs itself. The sooner we address these problems, the sooner we're going to be effective in providing the service that this community needs. And let's talk about those issues. And um, Chief Zimmerman, let me ask you this. So the crime trends January through May, five yes. months, were up by 12 percent. Uh, but overall, crime trends here in San Diego and in the United States have been low, all-time low last yes. year, I understand. So a lot of people are wondering, well, isn't this a little uh, overreaction? This is an early reaction to, what, five months of uh, crime? No, it's not an early reaction. It's uh, important for us to recognize that exactly what you said, the crime trends. We look at crime rates on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly hour basis. We take a look at our priority calls. And with fewer resources that we have now, with fewer people, that's fewer people to respond to this increase in crime. And what we prefer to do is prevent it before it even happens. So it's important for us to look at the crime rate, the crime trends, uh, you know, all, if it's five months or a day or an hour. Okay, so we're going to come back to the staffing, but I have to ask you, 
One of the criticisms in the media especially has been that, look, you're capitalizing on this very short-term surge in violent crimes to get more money. What's your response to that? We're not capitalizing on anything. We're providing real-time information for the council to make the decision, to help them make that decision. And it is very clear that they didn't read the report well. This is about staffing and attrition. This is about the service levels that we provide. And it's not just about the police officers, but it's about the, the communication staff, which is my most difficult hire. It's the crime lab and all the people that work every single day to provide the best level of service possible. So if you're focusing on crime, you're missing the point of the report. So the point of the report, let's talk about that staffing, 270, I understand, 60, between 260, 70 uh, police officers that have actually left. Uh, many of those during the budget problems, uh, two years of budget problems. But on average, what I read was about 15 police officers per year are leaving. Is that unusual? Is that an unusual number? Well, the 270 officers that left in the last uh, 10 years, that was a conservative number of those that have left to other law enforcement agencies. And not only do we have a recruitment issue right now, it's extremely competitive uh, because there's so many other agencies, especially locally, that are, that are hiring right now. But we have a retention issue because those are the officers that have been trained by our department that have lateraled or gone to other police departments. Um, and that's a conservative number because we know that there was many Many more and many others that went into private sector um, uh, that are no longer with our department. How does that compare briefly to other uh, cities departments that are the same size as San Diego? Well, if you look at other cities like Dallas or Philadelphia, uh, San Francisco, which is a little bit smaller, we have one of the lowest staffing levels in the country for any large city in America. And the reason I know that I sit on major city chief, which are the 63 largest cities, uh, we, we are efficient. We do a job well, but we're staffed at a level that we got got to get have to get ready for the next five years. And I'll give you a great example. When those two fires came on us, I needed every single officer in the San Diego Police Department to be able to manage it because there were no other resources. Everybody in the county was committed. So staffing, crime rates, very briefly, we only have about 30 <laughs> seconds. Let me ask you, um, dispatching, there's some equipment issues that you're, you're really, uh, the eight million for that. Tell us about what's needed there. Well, let me let Shelly tell okay, me, because she's the expert in the equipment. It's a 25 year old system uh, that's on language, uh, software language to call the coal ball from the 1970s. And our system is prone to failure. Just a few weeks ago, we had an officer calling for help and the dispatcher couldn't, couldn't hear the officer because it happen to go down right at that exact moment and it is prone to failure and that's just one of many examples where it has gone down. Okay, so these issues will be addressed by the City Council come uh, September. Come September and they get to make the choice and we've given them real-time correct information to help them make that choice. That's what this is all about. All right, Chief Lansdowne, Chief Zimmerman, Thank thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. San Diego City Attorney Jan Goldsmith is in his second term facing several big legal issues from pension reform to the convention center expansion. Goldsmith is directly involved with the inner workings of San Diego. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr sat down with him to get his thoughts about the challenges ahead. Mr. Goldsmith, what are your goals for your second term in office? Well, the city is going to have a little bit of a choppy period of time. Uh, we're going to have a new mayor. We're going to have for the first time a ninth council district under this strong mayor form of government. And we're gonna have new council members. We've got Proposition B, we've got Proposition A. Uh, we've got a lot of transition. Um, I, I wanna see if we can try to give some stability in the, in the midst of change. Um, and I think that's really, really important for our office to play that role. Um, but also, I wanna continue building our law firm uh, I think we've done a really good job. We've got great people, lawyers, non-lawyers, and support staff. Um, I'm really proud of them. Uh, but we can always do better, and we want to do better. You mentioned some of the big uh, projects that are coming up, Prop B, Prop A. We have the Convention Center. Of course, the Charger Stadium is always looming out there. Uh, what are your priorities? Are those big projects your priorities, or are there smaller sort of everyday matters you think we need to focus on? Well, we have to do both, and that's part of what our challenge is as a law firm. This is like no other job in my profession. I'm a criminal prosecutor. We prosecute 30,000 misdemeanors a year. We process them, and uh, some we issue and some we don't. But 
Uh, in addition to that, we represent the city of San Diego in all the litigation, and then we advise the city and, and all that. We don't, we don't really determine uh, the priorities. The policy priorities are determined by the city council and the mayor. So if they want to pursue gung-ho, a convention center, we're going to try to guide them and then defend the city. Um, same thing with the Charger Stadium and, and a lot of these other issues. Proposition B and Proposition A are a little different because the people put that on, those, those measures on. Uh, they use the constitutional process for a citizen's initiative to bypass the city council and put their own uh, legislation on the ballot and the people voted for it and approved it. So there I have an obligation and my office has an obligation to defend it and do our very best to implement it the way it's written. So we don't, we have to be ready. And uh, it's a very, it's like very few other uh, off law offices. That's what makes it challenging. You have said in the past that you don't want this office to be political. It's just about um, carrying out the law and implementing the city charter. But on things like Proposition B and on medical marijuana, you've taken a high profile stance on some of those things. So don't you feel that is a little political? Well, don't confuse high profile stance and doing our job in a firm way with the policy decision. Um, I, you don't know my views on medical marijuana, but I will tell you that I voted for it in 1995, a year before the voters voted for it in 1996. Um, I have personal views on things. I, they just don't go away. But don't confuse what we do as lawyers. Uh, for example, medical marijuana, we get reports from law enforcement that there is a, um, a, a building and there's an operation that violates our local law. We have prosecutors going to go out and, and take care of it. I don't care whether we agree with that local law or not, whether we think there's a way to resolve it, you know, through new policy changes. That's not our job. With regard to Proposition B, I was real quiet during the election. The people spoke, and I'm going to vigorously um, try to implement it. The last time the people spoke in San Diego on a comparable measure was managed competition in 2006, and it took the city four years to implement it. And now it's, it's working, but it took four years. We're not going to let that happen. We are pushing really hard. We're trying to condense the legal challenges. Um, I know, that, you know, there's a lot of controversy swirling around about it, but we're enforcing the law. We're not making the law, and there's a big difference. San Diego faces stark contrast in the upcoming mayoral election. Uh, either Republican City Councilman Carl DeMaio or Democrat Congressman Bob Filner. Um, how do you think your office will interact with the new mayor, whoever he is, and will it depend on who was elected? Well, our office will have no problem interacting with the mayor and the city council. Uh, our lawyers uh, are, have developed a culture, and again, this, we want to keep building on this culture, that we practice law. Uh, we do not, we're not policy makers. Um, our lawyers are always empowered, and this is something, a change from the pre aguirre year. One, one thing Mike criticized was that the city attorney's office was a go-along, get-along type operation. He then went, tried to correct that, and I, I agree that that's a bad thing. Just go along, get along. So our lawyers uh, are empowered at every opportunity where they see a red flag, raise that red flag, stop the proceeding and say, we need to look at this. And whether it's Bob Filner or Carl DeMaio or anyone else, we're going to do that job and I'm going to back our lawyers in doing it. Mr. Goldsmith, thank you so much. Thank you. Studies show severe mental illness like schizophrenia tends to surface in young adults under 25. Tonight at the roundtable, Peggy finds out if academic stress can trigger a mental breakdown and how colleges and communities deal with mental health issues. We don't yet know if the man accused in the Colorado theater shooting has a mental illness, but we do know severe mental illness is likely to surface between the ages of 18 and 25. That's the same age as most higher education students. To talk about what's being done to address mental health concerns at San Diego colleges and in the community is Dr. Sandy Jorgensen Funk, Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at San Diego State University, and Alfredo Aguirre, Director of San Diego County Mental Health Services. Alfredo, I want to ask you first of all, what types of mental illnesses tend to surface in this college age range? Sure. With most of the major mental illnesses like paranoid schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, it is often the case that the onset of the illness occurs actually between the ages of 16 and 25. 
So you, you'll begin to see those signs. Another factor is with, with just the nature of the condition. Uh, for example, with paranoid schizophrenia, many of these individuals aren't even aware that they are, that they are actually um, exhibiting uh, the symptoms of the illness. Okay, so we know the age range, we know there's a risk, but it kind of might pop up. So, uh, Dr. Jorgensen Funk, what sort of systems do you have in place for mental health, either support or programs at San Diego State? We have a really wide range of programming available for students to support them while they're on campus. It ranges from individual and, and couples and group counseling. Uh, we have phone consultation that we provide. So anytime a student is wanting to talk with a counselor, they're able to call Monday through Friday and be able to have that initial conversation to get a sense of what's available and what might be a good next step for them. There's a video, and we're, we're watching this video. Uh, it talks about suffering in silence. Is that something you, you've found that students Students in the college area really aren't going to speak up if they have a problem? You know, th th for some students, they are more apt to call our office or come by our office. Other students are less likely to do so. So we try to reach out to students in a variety of ways through the video, through other online resources that we have available. We have a center for well-being where they can drop in without an appointment. We just try to, to, to provide as many opportunities as possible for students, depending on what they're comfortable with. And, and speaking of that, the stigma around mental health, that's just not uh, college students. You have a program that uh, you help pioneer here in San Diego. It's up to us. Tell us about that program and how it relates to trying to erase stigma. Yeah, the program is really designed to address the issue of stigma in the community as well as um, provide education around suicide and, and really building more community support and awareness on um, helping individuals to seek help when they need it. Um, you know, this, this, this program really is designed to impact the whole community, of course, family members, uh, people that work in our school systems. To that point, um, much of our material, our brochures, our posters, uh, are actually being circulated on campuses here in San Diego County, including San Diego State. And so I was going to ask mm -hmm. that connection. Um, Dr. Jorgensen, in fact, how does a student at San Diego State or Morse Universities, if, if they want to get help or somebody thinks they need help, mm -hmm. what should they do? The first thing they can do is just call our office and uh, the student will call the office and we'll have them talk with one of the therapists and uh, get a sense of what's going on for them. We also really encourage students, uh, staff and faculty to call our office if they're concerned about a student who might be distressed and we will uh, talk with them about how to help the student get to our office and, and access our services. Okay, and we're gonna come back to that, but first, how about if you're in the community, you notice a neighbor, a family member, a friend, and you're like, this is just, this, there's something going on here, what should you do? Well, first of all, it, it's, it's important to obviously um, speak to the individual who you're observing and ask them how they're doing and reach out, let them know you care and you're concerned. Um, if, if you feel like the person uh, is not aware or is not going to seek help, one can always call the Access and Crisis Line and get some information. Uh, it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The number, uh, I believe you're posting it as well as, or they can go on the website, um, up to up up the number two sd.org, and there's a lot of information about mental illness, uh, early signs of suicide. Uh, those are real helpful tips for the community at large. All right, and uh, in both cases, these are uh, confidential interactions, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, that's really important for our students to know that what they come to talk with us about is confidential. It's not uh, information that we would pass on to administrators or to their faculty members. And also in the community as well. Yes. Very, very safeguards put in place. Very well, thank so. you both for joining me and talking about this. I do want to say that we do have more information about this on our website website at kpbs.org. There is certainly uh, links there for counseling and psychological services on campuses right. at San Diego State, at UCSD, and also in the community. So right. again, thank you for uh, telling us about it. Thanks for helping us get the word out. We really appreciate Thanks that. For, uh, bet. Thanks for having us.
In tonight's Public Square, my in-depth interview yesterday with two of the scientists who helped discover a methane seep 20 miles off the coast of Del Mar just left a few unanswered questions about the impact of that greenhouse gas on current coastal conditions and those mysterious odors that some have reported. To refresh your memory, graduate students from Scripps Institution of Oceanography found a hill more than 3,000 feet underwater that stands two stories high and is about a city block in length. Tube worms that live off of bacteria in that gas and rocks that bubble when tested confirmed that this was indeed a methane seep. On Facebook, Rebecca Reyes Costello asked what many seem to be wondering. Was this the source of last week's mysterious odor? Well, biologists on the discovery team say no, because methane is odorless. And even if a sulfur odor accompanied the gas, the seep is too deep and too far from the shore to be detected. Mark Dedrick asked the que this question on Facebook. He asked, any connection to the tons and probably literally tons of dead jellyfish washing up on the shore of Coronado and probably elsewhere yesterday? Again, the answer is no. Geologists say the seep is ancient. It's very old geological features, they say, do not influence recent sea life changes or jellyfish blooms. To comment on this story or any others you've seen here on KPBS Evening Edition, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, or email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thank you for joining us. You have a great night.